Hello and welcome to another Omnus Academy uh, recorded webinar series. Uh, my name is Katerina, I'm Academy Manager, and today we decided to create this webinar to join the November movement to grow awareness to, uh, related to men's health issues. So we invited three men who all work in health, but in different areas, and they will be sharing hopefully their knowledge and their professional and personal experiences. And besides them, we also wanted to know what men are looking for when it comes to their health. So um, we'll not have properly um, a structured webinar, but instead I'm hoping that we will have um, candid conversation around men's health. So first of all, I would like to ask our um, um, panelists to introduce themselves and why are they here? in this men's health related webinar. Uh, Christian, if you want to go first. Sure, sure. Uh, so I'm Christian Thompson. Um, I'm the director of product here at Omnos. Um, a bit of background about myself as well as a uh, former, former world champion kickboxer, you know, been in the industry for over 17 years and, um, you know, had my own health issues at times. So I dealt with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome that was uh, brought on through heavy metal poisoning. Um, I've been through many different phases of my life and phases of my health. And, you know, I, I think that there's a lot to be said at how people can sometimes either conflate men's health and also not understand the foundations of where these things come from that can actually still be quite generalized. And I, I think there's some really interesting topics that we can probably uh, discuss across the three, the three or four of us here today. Uh, most surely. Uh, so Dr. Cox, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, happily. Thank you guys for having me uh, on the webinar today. I didn't know that about you, Christian, so no messing with you, former <laughs> kickboxing world champion. So um, I guess my background is a little less interesting than that, but uh, interesting in terms of the topic uh, nonetheless. So I'm a medical doctor. Um, I've been working for about five years now and I, I currently work, um, I do a lot of stuff with respiratory patients and long COVID patients. I've been doing that for about nine months or so. Uh, and prior to that, I was on the wards and I worked in ICU as well. I've done a range of other different specialties, but I guess my real passion and interest is mental health. Um, and in particular, I guess, you know, being a man myself, um, I take a real interest in male mental health particularly given the context um, that we live in at the moment in terms of, you know, the state of the mental health crisis that we are facing and, and the problems that um, we are all facing, but particularly the, the, the particular problems that men do have um, in the world. So I, I talk a lot online about mental health. I've got a page called The Straight Talking Doctor and I have my own podcast, um, which I sort of interview guests with their own stories from different walks of life and, and we discuss all things mental health and and some lifestyle medicine as well, which is kind of where the link with Omnos comes in. Um, known Thomas for a little while now and uh, had a few sort of meetings and discussions around these sort of topics. But yeah, really excited to have a chat with you. Oh, thank you for being here. And uh, Thomas. Hello, Thomas. Thomas Olivier, um, um, founder and CEO of Omnos. And uh, my background is also uh, as a former not kickboxer champion, but swimmer uh, back in the days. Uh, and I've learned a lot about uh, health and, 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 you know, performance at this time uh, and decided to make it um, my mission to help people to, to take control and ownership of their health um, in the broad aspect first. Um, and now really with Omnos, trying to democratize it in the sense of making it all accessible to everyone. Um, so yes, um, I, I love this. This actually what uh, the subject of, of men's health because again, it's it's still way too taboo, <laughs> um, and we're going to discuss about this today. And and I really like the fact that we are doing that because it, it uh, has affected me personally um, and many people anyway. Uh, and the numbers are are, are there. Um, so yeah, good to speak about the subject. Thank you. Uh, and so just to start, to kick start to the, the conversation, I'm going to ask you a question and please feel free to, to answer. So one of the most asked questions is, um, what are the biggest lifestyle risk factors for men's health? And this was 
also had testosterone involved because it's a male hormone. So biggest risks, lifestyle risks. Um, so so happy to happy to sort of shoot off on that one. Um, I, they're so varied and and sort of you know will depend on on situation. But I think you can really um, break this up into sort of the core pillars of health in general. Um, and so what I often talk about with my patients are trying to keep things fairly simple, but breaking them down into into the different sort of foundational pillars. And so number one um, is sort of stress um, and looking at sort of your sort of um, levels of stress um, on a day to day basis. So um, being self-aware and taking into account, like, are there practices that you're doing in your life that are designed to reduce the amount of stress that you're under? And I think that's that's something that is so pertinent, um, you know, these days in the, in the modern world that we're sort of given this sort of global and, and political situation that we're facing at the moment. You know, th there's enough on everyone's plate already before you add in any sort of sort of individual factors. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd I'd start off with that if anyone wants to sort of jump in on the next point. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I think I I think what I'm going to say, Thomas will agree with here wholeheartedly. And it's uh, more, my point is more about stagnation. When men stop doing things, when they stop moving, when they stop, they, you know, they, they lose mo their internal motivation to, to go places, their agency to do, to, to take control of their life. You know, they stop eating right. They stop do doing any form of exercise. They, they, their mindset cut, that goes off. So it's going back to that sense of routine, positive routine and in, in, in ingraining that into your life in a way and I know like Thomas, me and Thomas have spoken about this before and we were speaking about it just before we sort of started the call, you know, there's this element of, you know, if you're not striving forwards for something positively, now it doesn't have to be, oh, I want to be the next best sports person or the biggest you know, businessman in the world or anything else. If it's, they're not doing anything specifically for your own health, that's when all those things start to creep in. And it's the death by a thousand cuts that I feel men are most sensitive to. In, 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 a, in this sort of uh, current economic climate and health climate we find ourselves in the modern world. And I yeah. think without going into the, the science of it all, it is just the way we are wired in the sense that, you know, you need to move, you need to explore, you need to do those new things to trigger your neurotransmitters, dopamine, all those things that actually will, will naturally make you in a more positive um, you know, uh, vibe, let's say, uh, um, it, it, it's, if you don't do those things, it's actually the, totally the opposite that's happening. Um, and then it's really hard to re-educate your brain, your, your, your habits, to actually go back into those, uh, you know, into those healthy habits. Um, and that's why, you know, to, to come back to what Christian was saying, um, I think for any man, and he doesn't have to be striving to be the best of the best, it's just this thing of doing, uh, you know, for yourself, a little, little step, wherever you are, wherever your starting point is, first is not comparing with others, uh, is your own self, right? That's the battle is, is with yourself. Um, and, and to really create many habits that you can pack on over time, um, but will, you know, uh, uh, be self-care. And first thing in the morning, you know, uh, first thing in the morning, because then if you're busy, guy and you have tons of things to do you you're just going to not prioritize yourself uh, that's why it's important it's not about being selfish uh, even if you have children and please uh, do this for yourself first because your, your you know your child or, or your partner will actually be a lot more happier if you've been taking care of yourself first and you're in this positive uh, sort of uh, um, uh, mindset because you have done things yeah. I, th I think that's a really good point um, that you make, uh, both of you, but Christian, in terms of the stagnation, I think something I've discussed quite a lot recently with, with guests of the podcast is this idea of purpose. And there's been a, a little bit of a breakdown for so many people in terms of what their purpose is. And I think males are slightly say the way we're wired was so driven to do certain things um, and, you know, build and create and, and do things. And a lot of people are finding themselves in the way that modern society works being sort of pushed into you know indirectly or directly pushed into certain areas that don't allow them to sort of find purpose and I think mm -hmm. we don't never get taught how to find purpose we never really have there's no lessons at school there's no you know unless your parents are sort of 
really sort of clued up to this sort of thing, you don't get a lot of guidance onto into what, you know, where you should be sort of directing your values and where you should be looking to sort of take yourself. And so we don't know how to do it. So, you, you know, particularly men in their, I think in their 20s, when they leave either education or start work, like going into the working world and they find themselves in jobs that, you know, potentially aren't what they sort of dreamed of doing when they were, you know, a teenager or younger, then, you know, they sort of find themselves stuck in this cycle. And that becomes more and more negative for a lot of people. And that can breed in stress and bring in then financial worries to that. And, you know, they're, they're really, it's a bit of a cauldron or a mixing part of, you know, potential really poor mental health. It's more yeah. interesting here because also the, the pressure of the modern society is there of you yeah. having a purpose and, and achieving things and constant daily basis almost, you know? Um, and, and if you somehow, you know, look at your first thing in the morning on Instagram and, and seeing people accomplishing all the things, you already start with this sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, glass of anxiety uh, because, oh my God, I haven't done anything. And then you can be paralyzed by it. Um, and that's what for most people, uh, most men would say, you have it all the time. And that could lead to uh, a lot more anxiety. Well, even if we bring it back to the, uh, the practical uh, examples. So we just spoke about, you know, having a good morning routine and that, that being a very important thing, being selfish, taking care of yourself first to be altruistic, to be able to look after other people. Mm. So for example, if I wake up late and I, oh, I rush, rush my morning, get straight into work, get, get the same amount of work done, but in the evening I've got no energy left for anything else. But if I woke up early, mm. looked after myself, did the same amount of work, same amount of pressure, I still actually have energy in the evening to do more stuff. It seems counterintuitive. Doing more, waking up earlier, get, you know, doing more in the morning to actually have more energy in the evening, it doesn't make any sense to people from a logical uh, point of view. But actually, that's how it works, you know, because not only does it, it uh, one thing that a lot of people I think don't really understand about health is that you know biological uh, system, the bi your biological systems, the biochemistry of your body, it happens through an effect of cascades. So um, some people would have heard about the circadian rhythm. Most people will have will have know what I'm talking about when I say internal body clock because people have had jet lag. Most people have been on a plane with jet lag, right? And you go, right, your internal body clock is shifted to a different time zone than what, where you are now. So that means you get tired at the wrong times and you're awake at the wrong times. So circadian rhythm is basically this internal body clock. And there are certain times where these things are meant to and should occur. So when they're not occurring at the right time, the cascade effect of all the other things that happen throughout the rest of the day are off. And then that creates this drain on everything else that's going on in your body and around your health. So by the time you, at the end of the day, you've been drained of the extra energy you would have had if you'd kicked things off at the right time and did things in the right order. So actually doing more can give you more as long as the timing mechanisms are put in place to do it correctly. And that's why I think it's so important. And I think there, there is a little bit more of um, a circadian shift for morning uh, activity in men than women as well. So it becomes, I mean, it's important for everyone in, in general health, but for men, it becomes even more important to get that little bit of physical activity out in the morning as well, um, because we're more wired towards those natural circadian responses. To, to some of this is the less you do, the less you do, and the more you do. Yeah. The more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Also yeah. on that topic of um, producing and this society, as Thomas was saying, that we are driven to produce such specially men, mm. um, it's easy to go overboard, right? Sometimes I hear men speaking about their schedules and then I wake up really early and then hit the gym at eight o'clock and you have no time. Um, they are taking care of themselves, but they are also um, losing themselves in all of that. So. When uh, would men uh, require to seek for help? Or what are the telltale signs that we can say, okay, you're doing too much. This is going overboard instead of just being productive in a sustainable way. Let's have a medical opinion first. Well, uh, yeah, go on. <laughs> you can go first. Uh, um, again, I think it's a very individual basis, but general things are looking for signs of sort of early signs of chronic stress and burnout, I would say are sort of the most sort of 
pertinent things to look for um and that can be different for a lot different for different people but you know things things first from personal experience i know what i do and you know i've got my tendencies that probably resonate with some people but you know if i'm overly stressed you get i get what thomas said and you get that feeling of like paralysis you end up procrastinating a lot more so you can't get on with your work so that comes in the form of difficulty concentrating um not achieving the same amount that you would usually do in the same amount of time um and uh, then you'd also just sort of, you know, you can look for the signs of particularly in men, you may start becoming more irritable uh, with the people around you. You may, you know, start withdrawing from social occasions. Um, you may do other things. So uh, such as sort of like engaging in sort of self-soothing activities. So perhaps for some people it's food and you start maybe eating in a certain way um, to sort of soothe some of that stress that you're, that you're going through. Um, and for other people, it may come in the form of, you know, cigarettes or drugs or alcohol or, or um, you know, any, anything else of that sort of ilk. Um, but yeah, that, that's probably sort of where I'd, where I'd pitch that. Yeah, and, and also I think the, the sign are, are very simple as well to identify for people who don't know, because you, you, you can have all those things, do all those things, and somehow society think it's normal, because the more you're being pushed, the more you you know, play hard and work hard, it, it's like you're in, you know? Um, but there's obviously a limit to that. Um, and seen many people, you know, clients or that are very hard worker and push even more at the gym. And then really there's a time where the body is just cannot do it anymore. Um, and, and the sign is always also how you are disconnected to the reality of you know your family your friends your you know uh, having time for spirituality um and I, I don't mean spirituality in the sense of um you know uh, praying and all these things can be all, all different things different ways of doing it but it, it's it's very important also to not packing things as you know you need to be organized but not like hammering things because i need to go to the gym for an hour I'm, I'm, I'm going to run on the treadmill for an hour because actually this will just put your cortisol way higher than it already is mm. and that's not going to do any, do any service at all yeah so it's more about looking at little things during the day of okay maybe i could go for 15 minutes walks it's just 15 minutes um you know if you look at, at a dog for example i mean i don't have a dog here but i mean they know like they go mad after you know if they don't go out for the day um and that's how we should be doing as well right and the more often the better uh, otherwise we just end up chewing your your sofa and stuff like that because yeah and this is exactly the same for us we don't chew so far but we do different aggressive things <laughs> yeah. yeah no i, th I think it's a, it's a couple of really good um points to sort of circle back on there uh one like like you said like you know okay if you're you're already in a stressed state going and pushing yourself on the treadmill for 45 minutes an hour two hours whatever else someone's going to do it's just going to push the stress but exercise or ev every single activity is a form of stress it's a form of something that is going to change homeostatic balance or you know the the, the normal resting state of a cell or of your biological being so if I dropped, uh, if, if you can't lift um, more than 50 kilos in a bench press or a squat and I dropped 100 kilos on you, you're going to break. Then you're going to be able to do less than 50 kilos because you're now not at full capacity. You've been damaged. Well, stress is just the same. If I gave you 50 kilos and the next day I gave you 52.5 kilos and then the next day I gave you 55 kilos and so on and so forth, the likelihood is that you'll be able to keep meeting that new challenge and you'd grow. So... Uh, the, when dealing with chronic fatigue, they often use terms like pacing, like, oh, you just don't do more than what you can do. And it's like, uh, it's not about, uh, and, and the same thing happens with stress and, and uh, the buildup of stress over time. It's not about not doing too much. I mean, there's times where we need to do more than what's under our normal capacity and we can flex into that. We call, and then when, within your, when you're training, you're doing that within exercise, you'd call that a peak week. So you would start, say, training at 70% of your max uh, week one, and through a seven-week period or four-week period, you would get to 110% of your max. So that would be what you do with weight training or stress, and stress tolerance is no different. If you overextend yourself for too long, you'll end up breaking, and you'll be doing damage to the system, and it doesn't have the resources to adapt and continue to grow. And then you'll be less capable than you were when you started. But if you slowly increase the strain in the, set, in the system and then give yourself a break after a certain point <clears> when you're reaching plateaus to allow the recovery to occur, you will, you will have the resources there to make positive adaptations to stress. 
So these two very important things, stress, uh, stress adaptation over prolonged uh, um, periodized pr uh, overload, and then also stress tolerance through the understanding of, do you have the resources to cope with what's going on right now? So again, coming back to what Thomas said, you know, understanding these, uh, and, and also what Mark said, understanding these signs that you're, you're breaking now, you need, to take, you need to take a step back, you need to, you know, need to do it. And uh, I, I'm very much a, a proponent of this as well, because mm -hmm. there are times where, you know, I run multiple, uh, work within multiple businesses, you know, I do, I'm doing a master's, you know, do this, that, and the other, and I try to fit things in, in a way that mean they don't clash, but sometimes they do. Sometimes I need to do an 80 hour week, a hundred hour week, you know, because that's just what life demands me at that time. Mm. So I've got to make sure I have the resources in the bucket to be able to flex into that period. And that when that period is over, I need to go back to recovery. I need to trunk stuff back down, I need to bring it back down into a, a, a much less demanding place and take my time to get my energy back. It's not about not ever doing that, but it's not about, you know, uh, it's, it's about being able to do it when you need to. It's about having functionality with your mm. tolerance and with your with your capacity rather than saying, oh, it's not enough. Yeah, I mean, and just to just to build on on what Christian's saying there, I think um how you're saying everything, are you saying everything is a stress? So that's your sympathetic nervous system being switched on. So we live in this chronic state of activation our you know our sympathetic nervous system is firing all the time and so most people's cortisol and adrenaline levels are higher than higher than they really should be for most of the time so then going to the gym you're just giving yourself another big shock of that so i think two sort of practical tips would be to build in practices into your week or your day which build an awareness of that so build something in so whether it's journaling in the evening or taking some time to do some deep breathing taking some time to try and meditate or mindful do some mindfulness to allow you to see where's your brain at you know how busy your brain is, is often a sign of how chronically how, how stressed you are and how much your sympathetic nervous system is firing and what sort of you know state your nervous system is in so building in those practices into your week or your day is, is super important so that you can realize that you need to then the second part of that would be take some practical steps to try and switch off that sympathetic nervous system tap into the parasympathetic you know that rest and digest system and so whatever you find relaxing make sure you're building those in so even when you're doing an 80 or 100 hour week it's still really important to say okay maybe i don't have time to do that today but i'm going to build that in for tomorrow and that's my time and as a man i think we often don't do that we we kind of like we say we don't we're often not selfish enough with our own desires and our own our own needs rather than desires i should say and so that's something i think that a lot of people don't factor in particularly when they're under mm. stress with work financial stress mm. um you know if they've got a family and they're you know supporting them and all, the, all these other factors they can really have a negative effect on yeah. um you know those those sort of practices and i think well, that's really important for men it's really important yeah. to ignore uh, those, those signs i mean um I like to say that you know the lockdown saved me in a way <laughs> uh, uh, because I was forced to slow down. Um, but it, you know, like it was just at the beginning of Vomnos and before it was Gen Smart, and I just had a son, and you know it was crazy time. Uh, and I was doing it was a hundred uh, hours a week, definitely. Um, but then I, I could, I was totally ignoring the sign, even if I was doing the first test of Vomnos and and Christian. <laughs> or ML were telling me, you burn out. I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and I was carrying on with <laughs> you know. um, and, and then when lockdown happened, the funny thing is my body reacted in a very weird way. Like I just had this, I hit the, hit the wall. Uh, but luckily enough, I was more, it was the lockdown, things were slowing down and we were sort of uh, uh, in, in a natural environment. Uh, but I got all those great things coming up uh, and, and you helped me to slow down. But I know if I would have, have carried on, something probably worse would have happened because it's not sustainable. And I was ignoring the signs. Uh, and now when the signs come back, I, you know, creating this environment uh, of, of, you know, the, yeah, taking my, was, was, Thing first and, and and changing things around it, it's so valuable oh yeah no like these like we were saying these behaviors and these uh, these responses sometimes are quite natural i mean uh, for example just going back to uh, what mark was saying about the autonomic nervous system so we have the sympathetic which is the fight or flight which he was explaining we have the parasympathetic the rest digest side of things so for example um eating is a parasympathetic stimuli so uh, and also sympathetic stimulus can blunt digestive secretions so from stress we can have these two 
paradoxical responses where we either get people overeating to try to smack, like you know, to pull up their, their their parasympathetic to try and balance out the stress, or their stress will just smash their parasympathetic uh, levels into the ground, blunt their digestive secretions, and create a, a a lack of hunger, lack of want to physically eat or do something. So we can often actually see that our responses to these stress are actually lived out in our natural responses to things as well. And it's about understanding those and trying to look at seeing where you can support them in the right way to really bring up your capacity to rebuild these things into your life in a positive way rather than being reactive. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a really uh, powerful quote uh, sort of I coined uh, when I was going through my own health troubles was, uh, uh, are you a product of your environment? Or is your environment a product of you? So as long I, I, I you know, I, I'm quite pig-headed. So I took it as an, an absolute affront to myself, my own honor, my own capacity. If suddenly I was just reacting to everything in my environment and I wasn't in control of it, or I didn't, I, I couldn't have an effect the other way. If it would only ever be affecting me, rather than me affecting it. It was it was a two one way street and it wasn't it wasn't okay. So I needed to take back control of that aspect to create a baseline of health within myself. Meditation is a wonderful tool for that because mm -hmm. you really learn um, meditation or just stopping and just you know uh, meditation doesn't have to be you sitting cross legs closing your eyes and you know if you can do that well it's great. But it can you just be you stopping somewhere with a cup of coffee or maybe not a tea? Sorry. Autism. um and uh, uh having a tea and just you know stopping the time just for 10 minutes is creating this barrier you don't follow with everything that falls into you you have an email you have things like okay this can wait two minutes um and you deal that in your block of time but this is the time to switch off uh, and those are, are very important tools that you need to implement on a daily basis especially for burning out anyway okay thomas um, circling back to you, and because a lot of parasympathetic and sympathetic and cortisol and adrenaline has been repeated, so let's dive into that. Um, you were diagnosed a burnout by Emel or Christian, uh, so that means that you took some tests, right? Yeah, you mean for, for the... Yeah, yeah, for your burnout, how did Christian <laughs> diagnose your burnout? Yeah, that was the sex hormone male uh, test that we have on, on the Omnos platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also the uh, the hormone test or the Dutch test, um, and yeah, <laughs> I think Christian saw my results. Uh, it's clear I'm burnt out. So you know, I, I was burnt out, um, and you know, I've been for for a while, and I was today. Mm -hmm. So Christian, you that test, and I'm guessing mm -hmm. if I'm yeah. here, but Christian uses this sentence a lot. What do you have to say regarding testing specifically for men's health, and also? So um, yeah. Transgender. yeah so uh look you know uh, we symptoms are the original form of allopathy right you know we we can look at symptoms and we can get a, a nice context of what's going on in someone's life but they're impossible to use to compare one person to another so you don't really know how severe anything is or where or, or if they're the key things to look at by themselves so you can get a good idea of you know, what your behavior is like, how you're reacting to things, what, what symptoms you're experiencing, like there's bloating, gas, I need digestive symptoms, but there's lots of specific elements that we can use around that. So that's the first stage, really understanding those aspects to give you a context of where you are and what's going on. But you really do need to look behind the curtain and find out what's going on from a, uh, from a biochemical, biological point of view, from an objective point of view, and combine that information to really understand the true targeted approach that you should take so just for example you could have a number of digestive symptoms but they could be coming from either a microbial issue in the in the gut so the bacteria in the gut for example or they could be coming due to you the, like hypochloridia you're not producing enough stomach acid to physically digest the food you know and then they can have not both of those things can have knock-on effects to hormone levels and again hormone levels can have knock-on effects on those things so trying to understand where the sort of the, the the first point of call to tackle is, where the the, the low hanging fruit is, and where the most important things that are more causal in your your own experiences are, without testing, it's just it, you know it's just trial and error. You're literally sticking a finger in there, going, ah, my assumption is X, and you know even the most talented coaches and and therapists and doctors in the world, they will be limited in their success 
by using that approach. You give anyone, even who's not a great uh, coach, doctor, or therapist, more objective data, they're going to do a better job. You give someone that's good at doing that without data, more objective data, they're doing an even better job. And, you know, even with like what we've built here at Omnos, you know, trying to democratize that process a little bit more, trying to automate as much of that as possible. People, you now, general users can buy the tests or general public can buy tests and get a bit more explanation about what, what those test results mean and also what to do about them. So it's not just clinicians that have the power to do this. You know, general users have the power through technology and more access to these sorts of tests these days than ever before to also action uh, a more targeted approach to resolving their health issues. <clears throat> this targeted approach, but uh, you know, uh, and this is the whole purpose of Omnos. But also it's important to always remember um, uh, that you have the targeted approach available to you, but the basics, right? The basics of, uh, you know, uh, well, the, the basics we just discussed about, finding time for yourself, all those different things. Mm -hmm. Doing the two together is very powerful. Doing, you know, those things uh, in singularity is maybe not as powerful in terms of results. Um, so yeah, I, I just want to mention that it's not only about getting in the details of things, but also uh, on the sides, making sure that you do all the right things, yeah? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to what men are asked, so, oh, sorry, Dr. Cox. Did you want to jump in? No, okay. No. When it comes to uh, what men are uh, searching for on the internet for answers um, is how to uh, measure and manage uh, hormonal imbalances. This keeps coming up. Um, Thomas was saying uh, a bit before that there's a lot of taboo around men's health in certain areas. So how do you know practices and lives uh, deal with this? Hormonal imbalances in men. So I'm, so I, I don't mind jumping in here. So um, the main male hormonal imbalance is, is that is more common these days than it was previously is low testosterone. Um, and so hypogonadism um, and, you know, even to the extent that like the range of normal testosterone levels has actually been shifted downwards uh, in recent years. Um, and it's important to sort of differentiate this in terms of, you know, this sort of real medical causes of this. Um, and more sort of, they're still medical, but more just sort of generic and sort of other lifestyle factors that are affecting, you know, so you can either have a, a real sort of diagnosable testosterone deficiency or just sort of a, a, a mild um, sort of deficiency that is more that you're just at the lower normal end. Uh, and that may also manifest in different people in different ways. Um, so it's more common, you know, so primary um, hypogonadism or low testosterone is um, a condition that relates to a problem with the testicles themselves. Um, and so different causes, some of them are sort of genetic and congenital. Um, and then you have secondary causes, which actually originate a little bit higher up um, in the hypo, um, pituitary axis. So in the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, um, and that can that can be you know a range of different co uh, causes and <clears throat> other things that then affect, affect that axis which are a bit more common and probably the things that people are noticing a bit more across a you know the normal a normal range of population is um chronic conditions um and general poor lifestyle factors will have a knock-on effect on that axis and the mechanisms by which the hormones are controlled and regulated um so you know, things like there's a link with obesity, type 2 diabetes, other general conditions like problems with your liver. And you also have things like sleep apnea. So, you know, condition, sleep, a condition such as sleep apnea, which is you know, something that affects your sleep, um, can also have a knock on on those mechanisms. I guess this goes into what Christian was saying earlier about having an understanding of the, the sort of um, cascades that happen biochemically in the body that, you know, it's not necessarily, ha doesn't have to be a problem with the testicles themselves or, you know, the primary organs involved in testosterone production, but other things in the body, if, are, if they are not in balance, you don't invest in them, can then have this knock-on effect. Um, so, yeah, that's the kind of sort of more of a medical side. I'll let you guys uh, crack on with, well, a, with a few of your other, other well, insights. 
Well, no, completely. You know, so what I was talking about before the cascades is realistically just talking about the, the hypothalamic pituitary axes that go down into the thyroid gland, the adrenal gland, and into the gonadal axis, which is obviously test testes for men. Um, so I think uh, I think that's probably where I'd primarily see most testosterone issues coming from. The other the other major driving force I would see more local to the testicles I would see is probably prostate. Uh, and I find both those both of those conditions have a high relevance to blood sugar regulation. Poor blood sugar regulation seems to just destroy testosterone metabolism uh, in some really really bad ways. So you know I think you know overall they're the they're the sort of key aspects I would be you know uh, keen to keep an eye on in terms of people's testosterone health. Okay, so Peter Terry again, and you every single one of you mentioned circadian rhythm. So yeah. for the ones that are seeing now and are hearing for the first time, does anyone care to explain what is circadian rhythm and how can you start to implement it with small steps? Uh, well, circadian rhythm is just like I was saying earlier, just like your internal body clock. It's just, uh, so circadian is just basically the definition of a day, 25 to 24 hour period. Also, um, Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, it could include the cortisol and the melatonin curves, so people understand yeah. it's affecting them. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, every, everything is affected by, like, pretty much everything in the body has a clock, or is affected by a clock. Now that the the master clock sits in the brain, um, and this is generally uh, entrained or regulated by light. So. The, the first the first thing we see, the first thing we see in the morning the, the sun rises that sets off the clock that, st that starts a time mechanism so the, uh, there's lots uh, yes uh, there's there's lots of theories about the type of light actually having an impact on the type of cascades that you'll have for the rest of the day so seeing sunrise hence why there's the, there's a, a very a very strong um, sort of group of people that like watching sunrise so sun gazers you know, and also sunsets have a large impact on our metabolic structures. Although a lot of the science in this isn't um, entirely fleshed out and, and incredibly firm, but there is very strong correlative evidence that type of light does have an impact on biological yes. function. If you look at the sunset, how do you feel after the sunset? You yeah. just feel like relax and you want to go to bed and, mm -hmm. and you know, you will produce more melatonin that will induce you to bed and, and your cortisol is lower. It's just also this very important dis disconnection that we have now with our natural environment and the lack of exposure to this natural environment, but also disrupt this circadian rhythm. Uh, it's a fact, you know. Yeah, no, completely. Like, so like what Katarina was just sort of referenced there as well, so as cortisol melatonin uh, cycles. So for example, to give an example of how these clocks might affect a, bio, a biochemical reaction, um, uh, the light in the morning actually helps us stimulate cortisol to wake us up, whereas the act, the, 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 the act or the absence of light, so the darkness, actually causes melatonin to be stimulated and released. Now, technically, melatonin is produced all day, every day, uh, in every mitochondria in the cell, in the body, which is basically the power, power packs of every cell. But it's particularly increased in its production in the pituitary gland when we have an absence of light hitting the eyes. And it's only the central aspect of the eyes that pick that up. Uh, but so the peripheral, as peripheral aspect. So if, we're, if you're wearing glasses that blocked out the light, the, the light coming through the outside wouldn't cause the same response, only through the central aspect. And there are other things that also change melatonin's release and other things, but not to get too complicated. The main thing that balances these two hormones, cortisol and melatonin, is light. You know, so uh, if uh, if we set the clock at X time by these light and dark cycles, that clock will talk to all the other clocks in the body. And from, in my personal opinion, the second most important clock in the body exists in the liver. And that has a major controlling element on how a lot of the other digestive responses function. And the third most would, for me would be um, in, in the stomach. So the, the, the liver and the stomach between them control a lot of your digestive functions and that they also have direct reactionary relationship to the clocks in your brain. Um, and if you don't set them correctly, they can have uh, 
aberrant impacts or negative impacts on how the rest of your day can go. Yeah. Mark, do you want to add your thoughts to this? I think you guys have covered it really nicely. I think I'd be repeating the similar points. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we can go on yeah. um, and scroll through the most asked questions. So we're reaching the end, uh, but we could answer uh, one of the most asked, uh, which is uh, what conditions and health conditions do men tend to suffer the most? Here we go again. Yeah, I think Mark, <laughs> you're... Yeah, yeah, I can crack on with that one. So. Um... Again, this, this depends by age group a lot, but I think I'll start with probably the most important one from you know, a morbidity and mortality perspective, but that is um, men are much more likely or have a higher rates of cardiovascular disease, particularly heart attacks. Um, and so obviously important because it's pretty much the, the number one cause of, of death across uh, you know, particularly Western populations across the world really but um that is due to a combination of different factors so you've got different lifestyle factors within that so you know, men's we didn't really come into this when it when we talked about mental health before but men's attitudes in general and their sort of risk-taking behaviors kind of feeds into diets and sort of some of their lifestyle factors but so for example things like smoking um and poor diet choices probably a little bit higher in in men um other causes and other reasons for higher rates are probably hormonal differences. So men do not produce much each estrogen um, and estrogen is seen as a protective factor for um, uh, cardiovascular disease. And then also we think that there's probably some sort of genetic component as well. Um, and one of the reasons for men having higher rates of cardiovascular disease is that they are more likely to put on weight in a different area than women. So we tend to put on weight around our trunks, our abdomens, um, and we have different um, compositions of fat. Uh, we have subcutaneous fat uh, under the skin, but then men tend to put on more visceral fat, so fat around the organs, so deep inside the belly can coat your sort of intestines and your different organs. And we know that this is linked to higher rates of cardiovascular disease. So yeah, I would say that that's the sort of first pertinent thing that you know i would i would i would say men are, are more likely to suffer with and, be, and should be aware of and therefore take even more steps to try and negate that with all of the lifestyle factors that we discussed before you know your exercise um eating a diet that's not high in saturated fats um uh, well you know i won't go too i'm not a nutritionist i won't go too far into exactly the the diet but you know eating a wide variety of, of plant-based foods eating a wide you know a high amount of fiber um and then other other conditions obviously that are a little bit more specialized to, or a bit more uh, individual to men are um as christy mentioned before problems with the prostate so uh, prostate diseases particularly higher high as we get older um so you can either have um hypertrophy of, of the prostate so uh, bph which is basically um a, as we get older our prostates tend to grow and that will cause urinary symptoms and then that can also then lead to uh, a proliferation and a growing and basically prostate cancer and so that's the two two conditions that i would say are, are particularly relevant here mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i def definitely this sort of uh, effort mentality i think drives a lot of men's men's health you know who yeah? You know, why not? Who cares? Just do it, right? You know, it's just like oh, you only you only live once. You know, it's like just this this type of thinking is what gets a lot of people, a lot of guys into trouble. And it's like I'll do it now and deal with it later. Con the consequences can you know, can can go away somewhere else for for a while. You know, I think that's that's a large thing. I think this is this is something that happens as well. Is we tend to be a lot more aggressive in everything we do. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think when it comes to mental health as well, um, we can be harder on ourselves. We can be, you know, uh, and those are the, and being introverted, uh, you know, introverted, sorry, be, be, to start with, uh, as men, we don't talk between us about those things. Uh, and this should be really changed because, uh, yeah, I, I've talked to friends and uh, I, every friends that I have, I, I, I try to open with them or they open for them to open to me. I'm surprised by the answers and it's really something. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think what Christian said there, that attitude that we have 
is one of the reasons why we have higher rates of cardiovascular disease, particularly because we do we take these risky behaviours, you know, whether that's smoking, etc. Um, but also with, with the you know the, the prostate issues, a lot of prostate cancer and uh, problems with the prostate could be managed much better and have better rates of survival um, if we were a little bit more conscious and willing to go and get checked. So yeah. we have a, men don't go and talk about their mental health with their GP. We're about I think we raised that earlier, 36% less likely to go to, to be referred to talking therapies for our mental health. But we take the same approach when it comes to testing um, and, and being checked. So people don't go, people don't check their testicles yeah. um, regularly. We don't go and, and get prostate exams because we sort of think, well, you know, it's not going to happen to me or, um, you know, it'd be embarrassing or there's a stigma around it. So that again would be a really important point just just to, you know if you haven't done that in a while then and you're listening to this then firstly do it and, and secondly try and make it a regular thing okay yeah. guys we're really out of time so if you have any final conclusions that you want to leave here well, final do, thoughts. it's just about the uh, again coming back on on the mental health subject for men is yeah, encouraging men to talk more and to really be open about it. Um, there's no taboo here. It's, it's just another aspect of yeah. health, just like you would deal with cardiovascular disease or else. Um, mm. oh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I was going to say, I, I think realistically it comes down to two things. First, generating your, your own positive routines. And then second, finding, uh, you know, finding people to share things with, you know, whether it be other guys, uh, uh, you know, any, any human being. Just, just to share aspects of your life with positive and negative, you know? Mm. In it, yeah. So I think they're, they're the two key things that really people need to start with. And then, yeah, getting more getting more testing done, you know, be, you know, be more open to taking <clears throat> care of yourself and uh, looking into things a bit more objectively so that time, from time to time is definitely a good thing to add on to that. Mm. Two really good conclusions that I would fully echo completely, particularly this, like, um, encouraging men to speak out because at the moment we're having just a number it's it's really really sad how many people are, are taking their own lives and i'm sorry to end on a on a sad yeah. note but i find it really really um really tough that in this day and age we're still having that problem and a lot of that 75 percent of that is is men um and that's because we allow our mental health to get to a point in which we think there's no return and i feel like if we were taught more and it became more of a thing um in our younger years to open up, then that wouldn't be a problem. But a lot of men that I've spoken to, a lot of people that I say that to, are like, well, I just don't know where and I don't know how. And so it's mm. it's a little bit of lack of education or lack of understanding of how to do it. And then secondly, we have a lack of resources or one or lack of resources there. And also people aren't being shown where they can turn. So I guess I'd just like to end by saying there are things online where you can, if you struggle to open up to your mates or your family, there are places online. So there's a great one called Andy's Man's, Andy's Man's Club. Um, and then you can also, I think there's something called Tech Shout. Um, and so there are different things. So if you are struggling, there are things out there, out there for you because don't let it get to that point where you feel like there's no, there's no return because it's really really important and so and then on the flip side of that i'll just add to that is if we when we are in a good headspace we make it our mission to go out and find mental health problems in our friends like you know you should sort of have that like if you have a, if you're in a good space we we have the understanding now that it hides in plain sight so people all the time we hear of people losing their lives and we didn't know anything was wrong so for me, that shows that we have to be better at looking for it and take more onus and more responsibility. And that's not saying that if it happens to you that it's your fault in any way, but if we ha all adopt that attitude of looking for it in our friends and making it a regular thing to check in with people and say, a simple way of doing that is like the two okay rule. So rather than just like, yeah, you're right, mate. It's like, you know, you just catch them off guard, catch someone off guard and say, but actually are you all, actually are you really all right? Like how are things for you at the moment? And Building that in as a regular routine is something I've tried to do over the last couple of years with my friendship group. I feel like we are much better now at doing that. And I think I'd recommend it to anyone. You know, it's dead, it's so easy, but we don't do it because we're all so busy and we're all in, in our own heads and our own lives and, and it can make all the difference. So that, that's where I'd uh, that's where I'd end things. Thank you for cool. that. 
really yeah. insightful and useful. So that was all. Thank you so much, you three, to come and join and, and sharing your knowledge and thoughts and personal experiences. Um, this is another webinar from Academy. Um, if you have any questions, conclusions, or things that we might help you with, uh, feel free to reach us at academy at omnas.me and see you all uh, in your, our next webinar. Thank you for being here. Bye. Thanks, guys.